This is a more than just podcast production. Welcome to Spotcast, Season 7, Episode 6. It's the Rapid Fire Edition. We have eight shows to get through today, so we're going to be real quick and real efficient and no lollygagging at all. My name is Timitra. I am in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm joined by Jonathan Kuline in Mississauga, Ontario. Hello there, kids. We also have Jaime Lopez Jr. in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? It is going well. Um... So we do have a fact check. Uh, Keen and our Slack channel let me know, or let us know, that uh, Jonathan had suggested that the Electric State uh, seems to be an original project. Turns out that um, it's not. Uh, It turns out to be a 2018 book by, or an illustrated novel by Simon Stallenhag. And, And I had seen Tales from the Loop on, I think the Tales of the Loop is on Prime. And he also did a book called The Tales of the Loop. And so that, Tales from the Loop, sorry. And that is a very, he's got a very distinctive style. It's sort of, you know, a uh, big boy, Sonic the Hedgehog kind of robot look to it and dystopian, broken down stuff. It's a, it's amazing art if you look at it. I'm sure it was a pick of mine back in the day. Um, so I've got a link here, a video of, of um, some of the work that he did. And The Electric State is actually, like I said, a book. And there's a quick little YouTube video showing some of the pages from it. Um, That one actually has a story, which I think is what the um, Millie Bobby Brown is going to carry or carry that character through the story. So uh, really, I mean, I I, Tales of the Loop, I loved it. It was like five or six episodes long. They kind of tied together through a common theme. It seemed like um, an anthology series at first, but it turned out to be like there was a connecting thread, whereas Electric State is actually has, has a full story. So cool. that should be cool. Thanks, Keen. Yeah. And so because we got so many shows to go through, we have, you know, as Jonathan mentioned last week in the after show, we've got three uh, Lower Decks. We've got three Agathas, including the season finale and the Penguin. penguin. A couple of, a couple of three episodes of Penguin, two episodes. No, it's two. 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 Okay. Two. Yeah. So eight shows um, to go through. So, so we're going to, we're going to stick to our form, concentrate on Star Trek this week, and we'll do a, uh, as we'll do the rapid fire on Penguin and Agatha. So with that, I'm going to hand over the headlines to Jonathan to tell us some of our Star Trek news. Yeah, so we're going to catch up on a little bit. Uh, we lost a legend uh, not that long ago. Uh, we had uh, Jerry Taylor passed away recently. Uh, she is someone whose names you've probably seen in a lot of Star Trek credits over the years. She was a writer and a producer on Star Trek The Next Generation, and she was the co-creator of Star Trek Voyager, and she was the showrunner there for a number of seasons. Uh, she was a huge, huge part of sort of crafting a lot of the TNG and Voyager stories that we love and uh, was a huge part of the Star Trek legacy and lore. And uh, unfortunately, uh, she passed away at the age of 86. Um, she was uh, nominated for Emmys. She was very well respected uh, throughout the industry and obviously uh, a trailblazer as far as a showrunner, as a woman. Uh, so she was uh, she was a really important part of not just sci-fi history, but television history. So, um, you know, obviously, Obviously, it's, uh, you know, these these things happen and it's, you know, uh, 86 is a nice full life, but uh, sad to know that uh, that Jerry's lo- uh, lost and uh, obviously uh, leaves quite an amazing legacy behind. She uh, she was a real force in the Star Trek universe. And speaking of amazing legacies, uh, we also lost Terry Garr, who I think was we talked about um, the cast of Young Frankenstein on um we were talking about Mel Blank a few months ago. Oh, um, Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. Terry yeah. Gar- Mel Brooks, sorry. Mel yeah. Brooks, yeah. And Mel Blank. We were talking about both of them. Well, they're, they're uh, both the honorees for my dog, right? Yes, that's, that's that was the connection. So, uh, but Terry Gar, um, if you're, I mean, the classic role, role, role in the hay, uh, <laughs> plays, plays the uh, German German girl, I guess. I'm, I'm gonna, it's not really Germany where they go Transylvania, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is somewhat over there um anyway she plays the, the the assistant to uh to uh frankenstein dr frankenstein 
um, made by Gene Wilder. And uh, but but the connection to Star Trek is the original series season two, episode twenty six. She was in Assignment Earth playing Roberta Lincoln, and that was actually I, I think. I forgot about this, but that was actually supposed to be a spin-off series from Star Trek with uh, Gary Seven. I think his name mm-hmm. was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, that's never... a backdoor pilot, right? Yeah, and I think that is that the one where they used the footage from the Apollo missions, like they something about the. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, there you're was right. a they were trying to stop or change or allow or whatever protect a a mission to the moon. Um, and that's one of the ones where Spock and, and Kirk and gang travel back in time, I think, right? Mm. To tw- like present, I'm doing air quotes, present day Earth. So it would be 1969 or 68, I think. Yeah, when they, uh, yeah, they time so traveled to the Paramount back lot. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, it's, you know, you're, you know, you're usual. And then reusing the footage from the Apollo to save on, you know, <laughs> paying for stuff, right? Um, yeah, so that was uh, Terry Gar, hugely missed. So she's the last, I think, surviving cast member from Frank Young Frankenstein, though, right? So uh, except for Mel, right? Mel still oh, with us. Mel. Well, yeah, was he in the movie? Yes, he yep. was. Yeah, he was. He, like the yep. professor or whatever, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, and for our younger audience, the things she's probably best known for. I mean, she was a big movie star in the 1970s and 80s. She did Mr. Mom. She was like in all kinds of stuff. But uh, for a, a more modern audience, she was Phoebe's mom on Friends. And that's a role. Yeah, Phoebe's real mom, uh, birth mom on Friends. And uh, she had a recurring role in that part. So I think uh, for, for the for the Gen Zs and Millennials, that's probably how they best know her. Right. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's dig into some. Uh, we got three or four, three stories here, I guess. For yeah, for we got some some tracks. So, uh, yeah, at New York Comic Con, we got some nice information drop. We finally found out when we're going to see the Section Thirty One film starring Michelle Yeoh. We weren't sure. We were kind of hoping we might see it before the end of the new year, but given that we're going to have Lower Decks pretty much running right up until the holidays, uh, they decided, I guess, in their infinite wisdom, to give us Section Thirty One, the movie, in, on January twenty fourth. So that's kind of cool. Uh, give us something to look forward to in the new year on the track side because uh it uh looks like it's going to be pretty cool we got a much more sort of robust trailer we got to see some of the other actors who are in it um i really i mean i I think this is going to be cool i'm kind of curious to see what they're going to do with section 31 after all this hype uh what'd you guys make of all this stuff well do you know first thing is like the the headline says you know second 31 trailer new york comic-con i assume Mm mm-hmm I can't see anywhere in this article there was a link to any trailer. I looked oh. several times. Hmm. I saw. I went back and watched the trailer from like three months ago. Oh, you know what? I, I'm not sure that they showed. Um, uh, I'm not sure that they released the trailer. I oh, think it was okay. shown. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But they did show. Uh, they released all the posters. They released all, and then they released uh, like a. There was a little bootleggy stuff going around. If you want to go have a look for it, um, I think people were. Re- surreptitiously recording it cool yeah it looks good i mean it's an interesting i don't know sort of uh story based on what i've seen in the trailers but you know and and she is kind of a delicious character the the emperor right and of course now now academy award-winning uh michelle yo right so yeah i yeah. mean yeah. Uh, i wonder you know obviously she loves this character she'd said like i want to come back and play this character but i wonder how much her price tag went up in the interim yeah yeah and I think since this is coming out in January, I think this fills the the time slot for like how do you keep subscriptions going month after mm. month? Defeating so, the Lopez principle, one uh, Lo- Lopez calculus, one thing at a time, right? They they do a good job because uh, maybe that's a lead <laughs> into your next item. Yeah, so this is interesting. So we obviously we're looking forward to next year. We're hoping to get the uh, the first season of Starfleet Academy, the series that is a spinoff of Discovery, uh, just like Strange New Worlds is, uh, that will focus on sort of rebuilding the Starfleet Academy in the far flung future. Uh, they announced that it is going to it's already been renewed for season two before the first episode is even premiered. So that's great news for Trek fans. It means that they at the studio level really like what they're seeing. They think it has uh, a future to grow on. It means that they trust the the showrunners and the the chemistry of how things are going. So that's a great sign if you're hoping for uh, you know positives to uh, to look ahead to. So yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm happy. I, I got to admit this trend that has been sort of happening more and more over the past probably two years of one and done sci fi seasons is really starting to 
tick me off sometimes. Uh, you know, you get into a show, you're like, oh, this is great. And they're like, yeah, no, we're going to cancel that. Like that, that had no legs to stand on. It's like, well, that's great. So now I'll never know how it ends. And or why did I invest the time in these characters? So. Um, but we knew they were taking big swings, right? Like they signed Holly Hunter and, you know, like it's like it's it looks like it's going to be a big, ambitious like this could be a pretty big um, uh, new addition to the franchise. I mean, talking about Starfleet Academy, that's something they've been talking about for like ever. Right. They talked about doing that back mm-hmm. in the 80s. They were going to do a Starfleet Academy series. So about freaking time, frankly. Yeah, and Mary Wiseman's back as, as Lieutenant Tilly. But mm. they've also uh, Jet Reno's coming back. Um yep. Played by Tiki Nataro, and apparently uh, they're 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 billing it as She Hulk's Tatliana Maslany, which but I yeah. think wouldn't it be black uh, orphan blacks, blacks. Yeah. yeah yeah orphan black is much. They better might want to go with that. Trail. That might be <laughs> the well, one she won the uh, awards for. Yeah, they're going for mm-hmm. recency, right? And then Robert Picardo coming back as the as the Doctor. Yeah, as the emergency is he coming back as the emergency hologram? I guess so. Like yeah, does the emergency and, hologram ooh. age or what? Yeah, and uh, Odette Fair is coming back as Admiral Vance. So yeah, it's going to be kind of a trip down. Uh, you know, if you if you were in on the stuff for Discovery and and that sort of collected universe, there's going to be uh, at least a starting point for you. But it sounds like they're going kind of their own way, which is which is cool. First, we're looking uh, and, evil, evil Tilly though. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh my god, <laughs> evil Tilly was the best. Uh, and the last thing we got at New York Comic Con was a, uh, a clip. We got a clip from Strange New Worlds, um, a little more of a scene trying to sort of set the stage. They really are kind of stringing us along and teasing on this. Uh, you know, uh, I'm. I think we've we've all talked about it. I think that and Lower Decks are kind of our one and one A favorite Trek things right now. Um, but you know, I keep getting these little samples. They showed us the trailer. They showed us the sample. I'm like, great, show me the show. I love this show. I want to see more of the show. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. But most what? of two of the two of the clips they've shown so far were actually like weren't like snippets. They were actually like a good five minutes or ten minutes of the show, right? Yeah, the one they showed at Comic Con was like a good, uh, yeah, three three plus minutes. So you know, uh, fairly. And this is the Gorn. So the Gorn is the Gorn the the lizard dude from that fought against Kirk. Yes, but you remember they they kind of brought them into the first season of the show. They were they were, they had basically like been brought back as sort of the big bads, right? They were going to be the 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 mysterious monsters in the dark, and they have the whole thing with. Um, um, her name that that lady that, that lady yeah, oh, yeah. Um, and they of course they run spoilers but they you know they end up killing the engineer and yeah so there's a whole like big bad they kind of are the sort of um, the Borg of new of strange new worlds right yeah you had it uh, it's like Lon Soong I think is the name I think you nailed it Lon yeah that's right thanks for having me. But this also leads into the prequel problem prequel problem because where was the Gorn during the original series then if that's the you know well maybe these guys is- are going to take care of them. If you remember my hypothesis that, you know, we see more of the Gorn life cycle in mm-hmm. Strange New Worlds, and they're, like, extremely vicious as they're smaller, they become a little bit more or less, you know, animalistic and, and more like a, a lizard person, but still pretty awesome. And then if you project that out to what we saw Kirk fight. It's probably a geriatric retired Admiral Gorn. <laughs> it's well past his prime. Yeah. 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 To go on when the walls fell or whatever that expression was. Yeah, really, really. Um, yeah, no, you, so you think this is like, like uh, what do you call it, uh, um, in insect life when you have like um, uh, a, a, a younger generation of... Um, you know what you, call, what you call it with like pupa almost yeah like, larval uh, and pupa and, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly mm-hmm. yeah they, they kind of play they kind of play it like the alien like you know I like I like the way they played it in in Stranger Worlds like it's a mystery thing you don't really know and what's her, uh soon says like oh my god you can't believe how vicious these people are these these creatures are without showing them right. Yeah, and then you've, you see the the battle clips that they've been showing in these two in the in, in, at least in this latest trailer. I think we saw part of this before, but it just sort of seems like it's like mayhem, like organized mayhem, right? Yeah, I mean, With, uh, I think one of the things that I enjoyed most from season two was the sort of development of the Lon character who is recovering from the trauma of being mm-hmm. held prisoner by the Gorn and losing her family and all that stuff and sort of her sort of finding her, refinding her confidence and stuff. That was like a really, really strong piece of the last season. 
Yeah. So something else to look forward to. Again, 2025, it's nice to know we've got a couple things down the line, even though we we obviously we said goodbye to Picard. We said goodbye to Discovery. We're about to say goodbye to uh, Lower Decks at the end of the season. So it's nice to know that the future of Trek looks bright. So when are when are we looking at this coming out? 2025 is all they've said. Oh, so like whole months from now. Sometime definitely not in, in the future. Definitely not in January. For what yeah. I just described, it's <laughs> almost certainly in February to keep that uh, that subscription money rolling in. <laughs> February at the earliest. You heard it here, folks. You could just tell they're going on. They're like, what time is account uh, at? Okay, we need to calculate this. <laughs> All right, well, this is bringing us to the main part of the Rapid Fire show, where we, mm-hmm. uh, we'll be talking about Star Trek for once, and finally, yay, after months and months and months. Um, but this week, we're going to be talking about three, count them, three episodes of Star Trek Lower Decks Season 5, the finale. So, first, should we go one show at a time here? What do you think? Sure. Yeah. All right, so first show is Dos Cerrito, which I think is Dos is Spanish for two? Yeah, it would be Dos Cerritos. I think is yeah. at some point they they mention so you're two, an two of the Cerritos. Cerritos. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So enter enter the wormhole or the time warp or whatever you want to call it. And um, yeah, space it was uh, Marinus is not another but not a space anomaly. Yeah. Right. So what? Uh, so what are your elevator pitches then? What do you got, Jaime? Mine was pretty basic. About uh, Tendi goes on a quest for a ship while. It's just another Wednesday spatial anomaly for the rest of the Cerritos crew. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I went with the uh, my one of my all time favorite quotes from any sci fi program ever, which is "Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal." Ah, right, right. I'll go with uh, "Tale of Two Cerritos." Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. So this we got the the, the warp, right? We get this uh, this, and it's actually this, uh, the our Cerritos ends up in their universe, right? Yeah, there's some discussion of like, you know, which one is the prime universe? So that you, that's an Easter egg there for like consideration of a prime universe. Like you have Prime and Kelvin that we've talked mm-hmm. about, but but who determines Prime exactly? Who's the correct one? Is a, a I think it depends if that Mariner's that. sleeves are rolled up and she has no interest in career advancement. I would call that Prime. I think it also depends on whether or not Billups is wearing a crown or not, because that was hilarious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. The one comment I had about this show, about this episode, though, was was just interject was when it started when I started watching and I went, wait a minute, like because they had the whole Tandy and her crew, the pirating, you know, infiltrating yeah. in pirating and infiltrating another ship. And I'm like, we're infiltrating another guy's uh, horde of cool things. And it felt very similar to the last season's episode. Right. Didn't it? Didn't it feel that way to you? Like uh, where the guy has all this this collection of stuff and. I think it's yeah. Tandy pretending. That, oh, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, they did the one with it, like, was... the guy who's the, the you know, treasure ship or whatever, and they were, she's bringing it from one place to the other, yeah. yeah or was that a, a play on another uh, another show? Well, this altogether? was a play yeah. on the Kivas Fajo uh, character um, from TNG, right? The collector. As a matter of fact, this guy is from the same species that he has as a guest in that episode, right? So, yeah, I think it's supposed to be like, oh, I'm a rare treasures collector. Because, yeah, my Easter eggs, there was a bunch of uh, bunch of stuff, a bunch of Easter eggs in this one. Yeah, the um, I, I guess for Easter eggs, the the intro has more chaos with, I think, a Tholian web. And yep. the I forget who the <laughs> yep. big green hand is uh, from the original series, I think. Yep, that's exactly right. And yes, they also added the they added that visual effect to the, the lower decks thing that they added in the fifth season of TNG. That when when the logo comes up and it's got that like wave effect below the uh, below the words they they added oh. that in on TNG and they added it here too that made me laugh I was like that is some deep cuts nonsensical stuff to copy yeah I have to go back and watch the the beginning I think I skipped through those yeah um, the uh... yeah they're kind of doing a greatest hits from the first four seasons they're adding them into the into the credits yeah yeah wasn't yeah. it Kane who pointed out on on our Slack that uh... They're mimicking the se- the, sh- the posters. Yes. Oh god, yes. the Star Trek yes. Five theme of this one is painful. Potentially painful. Uh, it's the worst Star Trek movie. I'm, I'll, I'll die on that. God hill. need with a starship. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna let that one slide so we can keep this one moving. Um, 
yeah, best PvP for this one I had was the pirating. I thought that the uh, the Tendi and her crew w- was kind of fun to watch. It's fun to watch Tendi be a badass because she's such a sweetheart, right? And so it's fun to see her, uh, mm-hmm. you know, her and her uh, her warriors fighting. Um, Easter eggs. Okay, so I got a few. Um, so in the room when they first do the treasure room when they board the first ship, there was a whole bunch of stuff there. The one that really caught my eye was there was a gold bust of the the original Grand Negus. Um, Mm. That made me laugh because it like it was very like detailed with the gigantic ears. Like yes, the gigantic ears one must rule us. Um, then we cut to the Cerritos and Mariners playing Calto, um, the the Vulcan logic game. And then the, the when Bormler bursts into the room, she screws it up, and then uh, Talin comes over and fixes it for her. That was funny. Um, there's a reference to Naomi Wildman, uh, which of course is a Voyager reference. Um, the Kazinti at one point when they're uh, the the two sort of uh, aliens who look kind of they're orange and sort of look a little bit like a lynx or a lion. Um, the Kazinti they're from um, the animated series characters in the animated series, and so are the blue Orians. Orians. Um, uh, I looked that one up because I'm like, what is that a reference to? And I looked it up, and it was like, oh yeah, the blue Orions. It's because there was apparently a color error in the in the original animated mm-hmm. series where they were supposed to be green just like the show, but the animator, the, the cells got mixed up and they ended up coming out blue. So they turned it into a joke like, oh, they're the blue Orions. That made me laugh. Um, and then Starbase 80, they keep bringing up Starbase 80 as like the worst place on in the galaxy. That is That running gag is very funny. Um, and my favorite moment of the whole episode was Boimler, the uh, alternate Boimler doing the Riker maneuver to get out of his chair uh, at the end of the episode <laughs> yep. was awesome. I laughed so hard because he had the beard and everything and then he does the Riker maneuver. I'm like, God, this guy's awesome. Did you guys spot any other stuff? Well, there was also, wasn't the, what's that, that doll that uh, Picard is given on the, the sex planet? Oh, the Horgon. Yeah. Yes, yeah, there is a Horgon those... in that collection. You're right. Yeah, in the collection. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, this, I mean, this show is like the best of Trek Easter eggs because they're such nerds for it. Um, and they did not disappoint in the first episode back. They were just jam packed. And I'm sure I missed a bunch, but those, just those, like the fact that they're going so deep cuts on like the animated series and stuff is, I just love it. I love it. Yeah, I'm also seeing yeah. in the, um, in the, I just see a still shot of the, the green hand grabbing the board cube. Uh, there's also the, the ship that comes back to get the whales. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The uh, quotes wise, because uh, I, I think I had the same Easter eggs, I had the same pew pew pew. Quote wise was when the two crews meet each other and you have both versions of Shaq's arm wrestling. <laughs> and one says, You've got great form. I learned it from strangling Cardassians. I did yeah. too. <laughs> it's like <laughs> such joy in their in their voices. Yeah. Yeah, there was, again, this show just absolutely hits home run after home run on the quotes. I really liked uh, (laughs) stupid rogue archaeologists with no ethical codes. (laughs) Again, a running theme throughout Star Trek of like, they encounter this rogue archaeologist. Yeah. Um, Yeah, there were some really good ones. And the, the, the one that summed it up perfectly was Mariner. Are you replacing me? Do you know how hacky that is? Uh, obviously being in on the joke of, you know, oh, we're from an alternate universe. I've replaced you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So good. Um, and my big question for this one was, and and we'll get into it as soon as we get to episode two and three, but was, is Boim's now going to grow? Is our Boim's going to now grow a beard? Because he loved the, the purple beard on, on uh, alternate Boimler. So stay tuned and we'll get to that one. Yeah. yeah. As of this episode, I wrote... Is there a big bad for this season? Because mm. normally I see something like, oh, okay, that's probably going to be the story arc. And it wasn't until the third uh, episode I'm like, oh, yep. okay, I think I, I think I have an idea. Yep. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, tackle number two. Tackle number two. Mm. Shades of green. Speaking of the blue, the blue Orions. Yep. Uh, I, <laughs> I'll do the elevator pitch for mine. Is it's not easy being green. Yeah. Ooh, that's a that's a that's a good one. I went very plain with uh, the the. Two plots of Tendi goes to war while the Cerritos ends capitalism. <laughs> yeah, the um, <laughs> for the best few people I wrote down a gentle, supportive mutiny, a cutiny. Yeah. yeah, I had that one as one of mine as well. Oh my god, it's such it's so stupid, but it's so funny. 
Yeah. Are, uh, we, are, we, are we going to add pointers to our... Um, pointers, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Our new, new section. Th- these new are section like Leffler's Laws, but, but, yeah. but different. Yeah. Um, yeah, the the two plots kind of worked well. Like, sometimes they do. They kind of sort of are splitting A plot, B plot, sometimes C plot. And you're like, eh, some's better than the others. But these kind of balanced out each other pretty well. The Because um, I guess the C plot was the, the rutherford Lynn one in this one, right? Where they were... Uh, Talim was trying to get Rutherford out of his doldrums for missing Tendi, right? But uh, the the end of capitalism storyline and the Boims uh, was hilarious. Hilarious. Just so, uh, anytime Boims is in charge, things are going to be funny. It may um, not be perfect, but I did have the, as a vague Easter egg, because I didn't have anything else good that I noticed, was that... Mm. Uh, post-capitalism is definitely true for the Federation. We see that in, in a bunch of other series. But outside mm-hmm. of the Federation, it's still very much alive. We saw that a lot in Deep Space Nine, where it was very heavily clear mm-hmm. that you're not on... I mean, you're technically on a Bajoran space station, so Federation people do have to deal more with capitalism-type things mm-hmm. than they would on the Federation-only uh, Voyager or Enterprise or etc. Yeah, a lot of talk about gold plus latinum in uh, in that series. Um, I had a couple of good ones. So uh, at one point, Boims is wearing a shirt that says "No Money, No Problems," which is a play on, of course, uh, Biggie. It's "Mo Money, Mo Problems." I thought that was hilarious. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily a Trek Easter egg, but a good Easter egg. Um, at one point, um, they're talking about Pyrithian bat milk. Uh, uh, Fox had a pyrethian bat in his in his uh, laboratory in his in his uh, medical quarters in uh, Enterprise. He had a pyrethian bat. So again, weird kind of deep cut. Um, when Tendi tries to give uh, De Erica a pair of fluffy socks, they look like the Alpha One Seventeen dog from the like the little dog with the horn on its head from the original series. Do you remember that one, Tim? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that was again a nice, a nice deep cut. I'm like, of course you would make socks that look like that. Of course you would. Um, and Gucci was there. Did you guys see Gucci? Which when, is Gucci? When uh, Badgy, remember Badgy and Gucci? There was like the the good version of Badgy. Uh, when Talin is taking apart the shuttle at the end of the episode, and she's like ripped it to shreds, and it is staying there. Gucci's behind her, helping her rip it apart. Oh right. Oh, I did. <laughs> that's right. I did see him there. That's right. Yeah. I'm like, anytime they get a badgie or a goodie in there, I am 100% in because he's one of the best parts. What'd you have for quotes? I had one from Tendi. I don't have an exact one, but, uh, you know, she realizes that her sister is pregnant. Um, and she's during the race, the space race. Hmm. She's telling her sister to watch out for gravitons, chronotons. Nebulas are filled with dangerous tons. Tons, that's right. Yeah, yeah. tons. <laughs> Um, I like that one, and I really like the one, the robot guards, <laughs> where the robot guard goes down to the uh, dungeon and says, I forgot to water them. I failed as a guard and a gardener. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, so yeah. stupid. It's so good. Um, my big question was, nice little stash, Boims. Is it going to keep going? Yep. And then her sister says, it's pronounced Orion. Yeah. <laughs> Orion. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. I mean, I think we've we talked about this in past seasons. You know, Boimler got promoted, Mariner leaves. We had all these like, you know, suspension from the group kind of moments. I think two episodes away from the gang and having their own little adventures is about enough. So I think this worked out pretty much as we expected. Tendi back with the gang before long. Although I, I like the Talin character. She's kind of a fun fifth beetle to mm-hmm. this uh, to this foursome. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they play her out because she's even she even has supporting uh the return of tendy obviously this this particular at the end of the episode right yeah yeah she's you know she's kind of part of the gang now yeah oh you destroyed the shuttle rutherford says <laughs> hooray we can all put it back together yeah all right yeah for me uh the, I, I still didn't really have a real big question but i i formulated here that like is um is growing up uh the big bad this season Mm, I started to suspect something like that in this episode. Mm. But then we get to episode three. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, that would be the best exotic nanite hotel. Yeah. A strange choice to name something after that particular series of movies, but all right. Mm-hmm. Have either of you seen those movies? I haven't. No, have you? No. 
Okay. I'm in. Yeah, I'm not sure. Not, not not sure that I have either. No. Yeah, best exotic okay. married goat hotel. Yeah. No. Moving on. Um, <laughs> I guess that's all we can do. <laughs> Right. Elevator pitches? I never can say goodbye. Mm. And, uh, resorts offer plenty of options. You can break up with your ex, go on an undercover mission, chase a glumpus. <laughs> I had, uh, due to the overt references in this episode, I had, I love the smell of nanites in the morning. Yeah, there we go. Mm. There we go. Um, my favorite pew 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 in this episode uh, was Boimler skiing. Uh, <laughs> that was oh, okay. Okay. like yeah. a freaking Wile E. Coyote cartoon. Come on, Brian, a, follow her down. <laughs> I had a slightly different one. It was the uh, vibing the Glumpus. Oh, with yeah. That special instrument. It like visually looked cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the dude who kept getting his hands taken out. Oh, Jet. Poor on. Jet. Oh, my God. <laughs> I just got my hands back. <laughs> um, this was another one that was like jam packed with Easter eggs. Um, the Dick, reference to the Dixon Hill slot machines. Uh, for of course, that was Picard's favorite character to be on the holodeck. Uh, the bar they go to is uh, is the Risa Bar. Um, they mm-hmm. reference a bunch of different episodes. They reference uh, reference the uh, Gormagander. They reference the Galaxy's Childs. They reference the Galamites. Um, so these are all like different cuts from different series. As D- Galamites is DS Nine, um, and then the Gormagander and the Galaxy's Child. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like this episode, Boimler trying to chase down Admiral Milius and playing Admiral Milius like he's Marlon Brando's character in uh, in Apocalypse Now, that he's oh, like right, right, okay. right. in the jungle, you know, they have to track him down. But in this case, it's like at, a, at an all-inclusive resort where he's a Latinum Club member. Uh, like, again, just what, a, what an absurd thing to to reference but uh yeah that the whole um him as as the marlon brando character made me laugh very hard what'd you have for quotes him, well uh she talks about the isohedron thing the 20-sided die oh i can't believe we're going to be killed by a damned I, I, icosohedron icos yeah i had that one with, with the counting she's like seven eight nine icosohedron <laughs> <laughs> again <laughs> it's a 20-sided die from D. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, um, the one I liked was, uh, Boimler. Okay. Look, before you hurt me, just know that I'm too frail to torture too much pain and I'll just die. And they lean into that. Like we brought you on because you need a a skinny, wiry guy to, to go through ducks. It's like 90% going, sneaking through air ducts to, uh, to do that stuff. The, uh, (laughs) Well, yeah, you're wiry, and then he greases himself up so that yeah. he can beat them up. Yeah. It's so dumb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and the, um, the the question I had for this one was, was, was uh, so Ransom says when Boimler puts the, the lotion on the first time at the Risa bar, he says, you don't have to worry about that. This thing can actually sense your skin and the sun. Yeah. yeah, and it, it adjusts it so you don't burn. But then we meet Milius, and he's clearly got a sunburn. He's got he's got orange. Well, he's he's got he's got the I was wearing sunglasses burn, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But why does yeah. he have a, that with he can't burn? Maybe he's using like a tanning bed or something in addition to like the normal because they say it was an artificial sun. Not necessarily there weren't other tanning solutions. Yeah, true. Um, also, by the way, for future episodes, I like to be known as Gilbert Manhandle. That's going to be my uh, alias. No, no, you're just Billups, yeah. <laughs> or or Zandy Billups, either one. Um, yeah, the the, uh, the B plot with um, with Mariner and the um, I don't know if it was the A plot or the B plot, but with Mariner and Jennifer and the sort of breakup, not breakup. Eh, it was okay. It did, didn't knock my socks off. It was funny, but it wasn't like the best part. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jaime, now your big question. You, you, I think maybe you and I are going down the same road here as far as what the big bad this season might be. Yeah, especially because Boimler continues, like, they, they did carry along his beard as, as coming in patchy, yep. but it's coming yep. in, and the Ransom was trying to offer the ability for his officer, his junior officer, to expand and, and do more things. It, it really felt like growing up is the big bad, where uh, Mariner um, doesn't want, our Mariner doesn't want to, the alternate universe Mariner did and said, oh man, this sucks. I want to go back to not having responsibility. Um, And this, in the meta look at this, this is a show called Lower Decks. 
Uh, there are definitely fans out there like, hey, why is this coming to an end? We want more. It's like, but but it has to end at some point. We could argue about whether it's here or season seven, hypothetically, right? But surely at some point they have to, as I've joked, become upper deckers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Um, they oh, can't right, stay yeah. lower deckers forever. Um at least not these folks. You might have lower decks, the next generation for the next kiddos or something, but these mm. ones need to eventually evolve and become grown up senior officers. Yeah. And, and theoretically go their separate ways. Cause even Jennifer says that in this episode is like, mm -hmm. you know, I got an opportunity. I had to take it. And that's, that's come up multiple times over the course of the past, uh, past four seasons. The yeah. And as an American, that, let me just uh, interject. Yeah. As an American, I don't think it was a coincidence that she's going to the USS Manitoba. Cause it definitely <laughs> seems like your, your American girlfriend is going to Canada for college or something. <laughs> Um, the other thing that I think was interesting, so the it turns out that the the uh, Globus or Globus is it was a tiny Federation ship from an alternate dimension. So this is like now they mentioned in the first episode that there was like these dimensional portals keep opening up more and more, and that's how they end up with the alternate Cerritos. Here we get an alternate universe little mini ship. I wonder if there's going to be some sort of uh, giant overlapping multi-universe kind of thing somewhere in here too because mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. i found it interesting that they they both made an overt reference to it saying hey that's like the second one this week as far as these portals or whatever and then here we had another one i wonder if it's gonna be a voyager class ship or whatever yeah yeah intrepid. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah intrepid class yeah but yeah i wonder if there's going to be a whole like uh crossover with other alternate universe versions of things it's something as part of the big shebang send-off for this thing yeah, because we had the yeah. we had an alternate alternate time slippy thing in the first episode, but not the second, right? No, no, I don't think we had anything there. Hmm. Yeah. Um, rounding things out for my Easter eggs uh, before we move on is mm. uh, the Star Trek Six style. Your genitals can be other locations, <laughs> yeah. like your back or your knees, which is where they were at Star Trek Six. <laughs> You're grabbing my genitals. <laughs> And the, Why are they uh, on your, your back? back? Where else would they be? <laughs> and the the one um, species that uh, Boimler accidentally offends by eating and drinking in front of, I think that's a Star Trek Enterprise episode where it absolutely they, is. And I couldn't; it was like Kretarans. I couldn't get the name, but it was like I think uh, they consider eating more intimate than mating. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, I wrote it down. Uh, Kretasins. Kretasins. Yeah, it was Cassins. something like that. Yeah, yeah they're the ones who were like easily offended. Yeah. Um, and because there was the other ones that they was the Galamites were the ones that they were going to send them over to. And we met Galamites in DS9. They're the ones that had like the transparent heads, right? With the brain, you can see their brains. Um, so, yeah, there was like a double double dip on Star Trek nerddom in that one little sequence. Let me get talk to that nice family over there. Which we knew right away was going to be a problem. <laughs> For Boims, always. Now, a word from our sponsor. Now, back to the show. All right. I'm gonna jump over to Le Penguino. Sure, let's do Le Penguin. Where are we? Penguin. The Homecoming. Season yes. one, episode five. Mm -hmm. And the Gold Summit. The Homecoming was, that was the, um, what's her name now? Sophia? Uh, Sophia? Sophia. Was this a Sophia episode or? Uh, no, Sophia episode was episode four. That was the one. Oh, so this is, this is the one where, where um, Vic takes the mom to the new location, right? Yeah, this is the one where they're they're basically rebuilding after Sophia finds out, and they're trying to get the get the shroom stuff back in action, and and get uh, Cobb's mom to a safe location, and and there's the hostage, the hostage first. They they kidnap the kids and hold them hostage to get the shrooms back. Yep, right, right. Which is why my elevator pitch was, you know. Uh, Oz makes a big move on the Maronis, while Sophia makes a big move on the Falcones. Hmm. Yeah, I had when uh, when your best laid plans fail, you can always go home again. Oz ends up back in his old stomping grounds, and so does Vic. It's true. In Crown Point, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Is that where where Oz is from too? Yeah. Uh, his oh, mom okay. says, "Like, why'd you have to bring me here back where it all started?" Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, and and even I think in the first episode when. He hasn't quite decided if he's going to kill Vic. Uh, they talk about, hey, where are you from? Okay. Oh, Crown Point. Yeah, I was definitely from that area. You know, and yep. he starts describing how um, difficult it was growing up in that environment. Yeah. Didn't, uh, well, so pew, pew, pew. Uh, I just wrote family barbecue. 
Um, <laughs> I had shroom or sun go boom. Pretty yeah. similar. Yeah. Uh, that scene was pretty, pretty harrowing. I mean, geez, uh, watching, uh, Sal Maroney's, uh, wife and son go up in flames and, uh, and then, you know, the action to try and get the, the mushrooms out of there and everything. Yeah, that was that was pretty intense. Show's not not dark. It, 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 it gets gets pretty, pretty crazy. Well, that's an important actress too. the, the woman that played um, the wife. She's been in a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of sci fi stuff. Really, she lately, was right? in uh, the Punisher series as well on Netflix. Yeah, she was she was a main character in or one of the main characters in um, the Expanse as well. Mm, yeah, she's got that like really really deep voice. Yeah, um, and I like I like the fact that like it's not just like the Italian mob of the Italian mob of the Italian mob, Italian mob. Like clearly Vic was married into this Persian family, and that's it's nice that they're not just like wearing down these same old tropes, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't have much in the Easter egg hunt. It was just felt a little bit straight. I'm, there may have been stuff in there, but I really didn't see anything. Yeah. I, I, for some reason wrote blood money, but a week or two later, I can't recall what I was intending with this terse note, hmm. <laughs> but otherwise I didn't have anything, uh, Easter egg wise. Yeah. The only Easter eggs I had was like, God, whoever programmed the music for this must've been in my, like, uh, you know, iTunes playlist. Cause the first song that they play regularly in the show is St. Vincent. They played Reckless, which is a great tune on the new St. Vincent album. And then at the end of the episode, when they're going down into the sewers and into the the train station, they're playing A Forest by The Cure, which is like one of my all-time jams. So I was like, this is amazing. I don't know who's doing this, but it's like they're reading my my playlists. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, best quotes. Which would you have, Jaime? Uh, I had, that's funny. Do me a favor. Call your wife. See if she answers. Oh, really cold yeah. way of putting it. I like uh, when Sophia goes to see Sal. What a funky hideout. Big fan of wood, I see. <laughs> um, yeah, Sophia, man, this, this, she's, I really hope she gets nominated for an award because uh, Kristen Milioti has been a, just an amazing performance in the series. But when she does the line where she's talking to, uh, talking about when she kills her whole family, she says, I killed them all, and I'm so glad they're dead. My family disposed of my mother like she was nothing. Then they did the same to me. Like, she's just, oh, man. I mean, it's good writing, but her delivery is fantastic. Yeah, and that that one character that you said keeps surviving, she, you know, dealt with him. Yep, yep. Uh, What's his name? Johnny. Johnny VD. Johnny. Yep, Johnny's finally. <laughs> that was a, that was a pretty cold moment because he's like, "Well, I I survived being chained up and frozen. I, I'm I'm part of the new team." And she just puts one through his forehead. <laughs> um, my big question is one that we've talked about on a number of different shows. It's start, becoming a problem in Star Wars, and here it is rearing its ugly head in the Penguin. Do you remember back back when getting stabbed in the gut was a fatal injury? Like it, they just treat it so cavalier, like oh, it's like Sal gets knifed in in uh, the end of the last episode and then here he's like oh I'm, I'm gonna go make some stuff in the kitchen like what are you kidding me you got stabbed in the gut mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i'd just like to say an r.i.p to the purple maserati which was just an absolute banger of a ride mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we'll miss you purple maserati <laughs> any other cues yeah i mean that was a, that whole um sorry go ahead big questions only three more episodes left where are we going to go with this? I mean, Good somebody's going to somebody's going to die, and I don't think it's the penguin or Sophia. Well, who knows? Sometimes great characters are made to die. Yeah, maybe. See our review of Agatha in about eight minutes. Yeah. Um, okay, so Penguin episode six, Gold Summit. Mm-hmm. Uh, my elevator pitch was sorry, Oz. It's never just business. Yeah, I had. Um two different takes i had uh how far are you willing to go which lines will you cross mm. and the first taste is free yeah yeah perfect isn't that uh, simple drug economics right there yeah exactly the uh i went with a different kind of take on the pew 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 i really like the scene with sophia and eve the penguin's girlfriend where eve thinks she's gonna get killed and is basically like setting herself up for it and then they just sort of kind of talk it out just the tension of that scene was really like edgy. Uh, wasn't really sort of traditional pew pew pew, but like the energy of it was pretty crackling. Those two put on a really good show. Yeah, and, and I mean, I like I kind of like the the respect of um, Sophia, kind of respecting the fact that she's just trying to protect the girls, her own yep. girls, right? Yep. So, 
and and you know and revealing to eve that she wasn't in fact the hangman right yeah right right it was like a you know mutual respect where uh she went out of her way to draw sophia to her right yep. like I'm, I'm throwing myself to try to exchange my life for the girl's life and it's like all right well you did that i'm gonna exchange you this knowledge about my father i'm not the hangman but you live she gave me what i needed the information i needed to get at oz yeah uh did you have a different pew 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 hangman uh, a more literal one where Victor caps the bully. I forget the bully's yeah. name. Squid or Squid. something like that. Squid, yeah. Yeah, that was that was a tough watch. I mean, you know, we've obviously we've seen Vic sort of turn towards the darkness, choosing to to stay with Oz instead of going with his girlfriend. But, you know, knowing that he has to take care of Squid, he tries to buy him off. He won't won't take the buy off, and he's basically like, I'm gonna go and tell the other gangs where you guys are, and he's he knows he's got what he's gotta do, but watching him do it and react to it was that was pretty intense that's pretty intense yeah he, he tries so hard and you see the the purity in vic's character and i like the connection with oz where oz sees him and he comforts him is like you know it it gets easier you know you're you're part of this uh, this lifestyle now it's really hard now but you, you'll be doing this enough that it does get easier he never yeah. says it gets easy he just says it gets easier well, and it's it's a tricky one, too, because, you know, like, I think we're supposed to, as viewers, sort of wonder, like, is this really who Vic is? Is he is he really going to go down this path or is he going to is he going to sort of still be able to find, you know, uh, a, a path towards the light? And, you know, killing his first person is pretty is a pretty large bridge to cross. Right. I was trying to figure out where I saw Squid from is Jared Abramson, but he's from. That show Travelers, which I was telling you guys about before. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I never watched yeah. that, but uh, I, I do remember you mentioning that. So he's from that show, huh? I finally figured out. It was, took me f- like six episodes. I finally figured out where I knew Vic from. He was on Runaways. He was the guy. He was the, one of the main characters on Runaways. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Like it, like three years ago, so he was younger. But yeah, I, I, I knew I knew his face. I'm like, God, he looks so familiar, but I can't place it. And yeah, it was not till this week. Where I was like, oh, my God, it's that kid. Well, I just looked at a picture of, uh, of um, yeah, he had the glasses and the, the big fro. Yeah. Um, I just saw a picture of Colin Farrell. I'm like, wh- who's he playing this show? <laughs> <laughs> a credit to the work that's been done by both his acting and the, the makeup artist that you, you have to think about it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard to know which is which is more worthy of an award nomination because uh, they're both like, exceptional. Yeah, well, um, like you said, I, th- I think that they're they're they definitely won't. I can't see this show being passed over for Emmys. For I really two. hope it isn't. I mean this this is this is high quality TV. This is you know uh, I won't say it's the Sopranos, but I mean there are some some really hard hitting moments and some terrific performances. Well, even the performance by the mom, Deirdre oh. O'Connell, like she's just phenomenal because you really get the yeah. the dimension and a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, really well said, Tim. I think I I couldn't agree more. I thought she was a bit of a revelation in this episode. She'd been playing it well, but that the scene where she sort of breaks down and talks to Oz, like that was that was really really impressive stuff. Yeah, especially because it's one of those like which is more horrifying: losing your mind and not knowing, or knowing that you're losing it yeah uh, and and what do you do uh pretty well played i think in this one yeah the only easter egg i pulled out of this one was uh they they reference polly's diner uh and polly's diner is uh it's from the arkham video games there's like a whole part of the video games i don't know if you guys have ever played those um but i love those games those those are some of my very favorite video games i've ever played and uh yeah, Polly's Diner. I was just like, that's a great, great Easter egg. So, yeah, I like that one. For mine, I had that Roxy's lampshade looks a lot like an umbrella, which leads to the, mm. you know, the the more wah, 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 you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, 1960s Batman version of the Penguin. Yeah, great call. Um, quotes. I love the the one from Oz where it's at the beginning of the episode and he says, uh, Oz says to Vic, you know how meaningful that is, Vic, to be the guy in the neighborhood who takes care of people? They're going to tell stories about us one day, kid. 
the way that he's sort of patterning his life after the you know the the monologue that he has in the first episode talking to Alberto about you know this this legendary crime boss and they had a parade for him in the streets when he died and and Oz trying to carve that out for himself to be somebody who's important to be somebody who matters uh not just to the crime but to to the community is that's that's it really does a great job of speaking to what motivates him it's not just money so the episode ends on a pretty terrifying moment as we see Vic and uh and Oz's mom and we see the hangman come in at the door and obviously we had talked about this a couple episodes back you know is 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 it a matter of time before Sophia finds out about the mom right Right, um, right. I, I have a tell you, we have two episodes left. I have a tough time thinking that Vic goes in this one. I feeling like the mom might not make it through the next one, but I yeah. don't know if I don't know if it's would be satisfying if if Vic went here. No, and the mom's got to mean a whole lot to to Penguin, right? So yeah, because he's very protective of her, right? Oh yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. my thought is that that. She's probably gonna. Sophia's probably gonna end up killing the mom. Vic's gonna get away, and then uh, Vic tells Oz. Oz. Then it's the showdown in the final episode. Oz versus Sophia. Or you know, you killed my family. You killed my brother. You killed my mom. Let's let's do this to the death. Which would be great TV. Right. Right. That was my big question. Like, how does Sophia handle this now that she has two hostages? That means something to Oz. Yeah. Yeah. Still continues to be amazing TV. A couple of good quotes, uh, just to to close this out for my uh, things that I wrote down, uh, both from from Oz uh, at the Gold Summit. He's like, you know, they run crap, we eat crap. Yeah. Um, And the other one of like, they're so busy with their noses up, they'll never think of looking down for the Mm. uh, the underground. uh, Was it like the underground metro trains or something like that that they're hanging out in? Yeah, they're basically they're, they're like the old, uh, what do you say? It's like trolley system or something, right? Trolley, trolley. Right, right. Yeah. 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 And there's also the doctor dude who's from, I don't know if you guys watched uh, Sons of Anarchy. No. Yeah, he, uh, the young Mexican dude or Hispanic dude, he um, he plays sort of a double agent in Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. Spoilers! Well, it's like been over for four years right <laughs> yeah he well he was on uh he was on power man right uh that actor he was he was on both seasons of power man uh what were they called luke cage sorry a power man yeah okay pa- power cage. man is luke cage to me i'm yeah. sorry i'm, I'm a yeah nerd. yeah no, okay, okay. i got it yeah yeah i never did watch luke cage except for i saw only saw him in um of the defenders, a girl with a name, Jessica Jones. Jessica yeah. Jones. Yeah. Jessica yeah. Jones. Yeah. yeah. I like. I I really like Mike Coulter as an actor, and I really actually liked his performance. Um, there was some like him and Alfred Woodard, and uh, yeah, that was some like. I mean, Marshall Ali was in that. That's that's that was a really good show. There's, it's worth going back and having a watch. Okay, so we got Agatha all along. We got three episodes to close out the series, the season. So first up is Death Hand in Mine. I don't remember what that one's about. That uh, was elevator the pitches. Focused episode. Yeah, it's the uh, the fortune tellers oh, test. The, the, yeah, the what's her name, Lilia. Lilia. Yeah. Sorry, I may we I missed your uh, your elevator pitch there. Oh yeah the 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 fortune tellers test. Hmm. Yes. Mm. I had uh, if you mess with the sword long enough, you'll eventually you'll get the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This uh, we had talked about it as we were discussing the earlier episodes that. Uh, Lilia kept having these disassociative moments where she was clearly talking to someone else or seeing something else or having visions or something was up with Lilia, but we really didn't know what was going on there. And the way this episode sort of played back through those episodes of what she was seeing and how it all tied together, I thought was really expertly done, like really came together nicely. I didn't see all the twists and turns in that of who she was talking to. And as she was sort of jumping through her different parts of her life, I, I thought that they handled that really well and, and made all those previous statements make sense. And then she also sort of foreshadows something that will happen in a later episode for Agatha as well. Right. So that's kind of neat. The best pew 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 I thought was the, the tower when uh, at, mm-hmm. at the end, when the tower is, is reversing and, uh, 
just that twist of she grabs the card and flips it over and says tower reversed and you see all the seven start falling and that that was right, yeah. again really well filmed and just uh just that moment of knowing what to do and knowing what the price was going to be was was really such a a strong moment for a character who you know we didn't we didn't have a ton of time with her all things being equal seven episodes you know or six i guess she didn't really come along until episode 2 um you know, she turned into a real something. Like, I mean, Patty Lapone is an amazing performer, and she made you care about that character, and really made you invest in and in who she was. I mean, I got to be honest. When the first two characters died, Mrs. Davis and and Alice, I was like, mm-hmm. but when when this came around and it was her time to go, I was a little bit, you know, like, oh, I liked her. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit, yeah. bit uh, disappointing for sure. Yeah. Any other pew pew pews for you guys? I, I had the same one, but I, I went with, you know, it's striking enough and so cool and unique. I'm like, it's very non-traditional as a pew, pew, pew of like, uh, given that we do swords and fantasy stuff, do we need a shing, shing, shing <laughs> metal sound for non-traditional pew, pew, pew? Oh, can we would have to put that into the Lord of the Rings and Game exactly. of Thrones? And, yeah, yeah. yeah, they've tended to have pew, pew, pew as of like flinging fireballs or <laughs> dragons breathing. I'm like, okay, that's more like pew, pew, pew. But this, this is a, a very different pew, pew, pew. Yeah, it remind me a lot of a lot of video games too, like where the solution is to turn the table upside down, kind of thing. You know, mm-hmm. 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 yeah, it's like a logic or puzzle or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like I did. I'm not really super familiar with tarot. I think uh, on the last episode that we did, I, I had looked up a few things just to try and understand a little bit more. But um, it was interesting to see how you know they get it wrong when you first see um, Billy and Agatha doing it, and he can't do it right. And then you see Lilia come in, and she understands how tarot works and what the cards can mean. And I thought that was really interesting. Again, it wasn't something I was familiar with, but it was it was funny. And so according according to IMDb, the which is uncommon, they say for for TV shows and movies, the meaning of each card is actually the real meaning of the card as described by or how they were actually written. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this show seems like it's been a a pretty good love letter to sort of the 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 legacy of witches in pop culture and history, and so I think if they had flubbed that, it would have been a bit of a glaring thing, right? What'd you have for your Easter eggs? Well, apparently the second, I didn't know this, but the second sword to fall is um, the Alathian's, Alathian sword from Conan the Barbarian. Oh, nice. Oh, I did not notice that. But it makes sense because, uh, you know, there's Maleficent, the Wicked Witch of the West. Mm-hmm. Um, Linda. Linda, <laughs> right, right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call a uh, Get Out movie style of falling down in inky blackness yeah uh seemed very reminiscent of that um also the the song used at the very end in the the credits uh, is the same song used by quicksilver in one of the x-men first class movies mm. when when he you know they're facing off with the guards and then he runs around the kitchen yeah, stopping the cops. yeah 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 when he's rescuing all the people no th- this is the movie right before that one this yep. isn't the mansion blowing up, rescuing people. This is saving Charles Xavier, Magneto, and Wolverine from getting shot up by the cops. Yep. Or the guards or something. I think they're breaking out Magneto. I forget exactly what the context was. Well, the the, the song in the credits is Time in a Bottle by Jim Croce. Thank you. That's right. It is Time yep. in a Bottle. I couldn't yep. remember the title. Yep. Yeah, which is it was a big deal in the 70s. Yep. The late great. Lots of slow dances to that song. Um, quotes. Uh, I think, yeah, there was a lot of little sort of short, pithy ones. Uh, Billy saying, she's not my mom. I have a mom talking about Wanda. Um, and, and that one is a good quote because it comes back in, in subsequent episodes, that, that same sort of line. Um, I like Agatha's, you want straight answers? Ask a straight lady. Straight lady. Yeah. I had that uh, one as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I was falling. I will fall from Lilia, like understanding how her visions were working like i had a dream i was falling and understanding that i will because i saw it i will fall i thought that was a really good foreshadowing line um and yeah when she calls you a coward hit the deck from lilia that was sort of her parting note to agatha which which again we'll talk about in a couple episodes and then uh i just the the lilia the the great line delivery from uh um her where she says i loved being a witch just just 
I thought that was such a beautiful sentiment to end this sort of, you know, she did, she'd lived for hundreds of years. She had this complicated life, but that she was like, I wouldn't change a thing, you know? Like, I think we should all die with that as opposed to regrets, yeah. right? Um, any other quotes, Jaime? No other quotes. No, that was the one that uh, that stuck out to me. Big it, question. Agatha definitely has a lot that could be selected. Uh, it's hard to oh, keep yeah. up with her. Well, Lilia says the, t- the flow of time is an illusion. Yeah, that sounded very uh, DS9 to me. But you exist here. Um, what do you have your big question? As of this episode, it is what's up with Rio being the embodiment of death mm. and something that can combat Agatha physically? Must be something behind it. Yeah. Again, as of watching episode seven. Yeah. Yeah, we had talked in earlier episodes. There were there were hints that she was Blackheart or she was, you know, Mephisto or, you know, all these sort of different comic interpretations of, you know, something nefarious to do with death. But I had seen some speculation online. People were suspecting that she was simply death herself. Um, I thought maybe she was going to turn to be Blackheart because death is a tough character to to play. And it's a tough character to explain especially when they were sort of intimating that agatha and her had this like possibly romance possibly complex relationship i wasn't sure if death itself made sense um though having watched the final two episodes it it does tie together nicely i just in the moment i wasn't 100 percent sure um my my question as of this seventh episode was now we've already lost sort of subsequent characters and subsequent episodes We've got three characters left. Does that mean that Jen is going to live or Jen is going to die? Because they were kind of killing off character, killing off character, killing off character. I was like, well, how how likely is it that Jen makes it out of this? So then we jumped to episode eight. Follow me, my friend, to glory at the end. Yeah, interesting episode. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, um, my elevator pitch was it's the end of the road or is it? <laughs> Mine is going to pair up and you'll see why with episode nine the series Mm. finale um mine is it was billy all along (laughs) that's what i had (laughs) that's the exact pitch i had for episode nine yeah Mm. i I think you sort of have to go with something like uh, buried in the backyard sort of deal (laughs) she actually is buried in her own backyard i believe right she she is Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this one was yeah, I mean, kind of interesting in that we get sort of the culmination of the what we understand to be the Witch's Road, and, you know, we get the last trial, we get Jen realizing that Agatha actually had, it was Agatha all along who had been the one who had bound her from her powers, and mm, that right. she, from that, has has now regained her powers, and she... So you have nothing. She goes free, which was kind of cool, and then... We also get sort of the the very intense scene where Agatha tries to help Billy find Tommy. And, you know, we we get I got I'll, I'll just jump ahead to the quote, but where she says, Agatha, am I killing this boy so my brother can live? Like that was pretty an, an intense thought, right? Like, am I doing this or is this happening? And so therefore mm-hmm. Tommy can live. Yeah, a really and tough then, one to understand. Like, is is this being an opportunist? Uh, for an empty vessel yeah Yeah. or did you cause the empty vessel to happen yeah yeah and then of course the episode culminates with you know uh agatha versus death or rio slash death and uh and then billy as wiccan appearing and then sort of having that moment of you know what's what's gonna happen who's you know how does this play out is like how could you beat death right and it turns out you can't so that was my that was my pew 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 was the, the that sort of final battle between Agatha and Death and just her understanding that it was time for her to embrace death as opposed to trying to avoid death. Right. Well she kept killing people. That was her her whole reason for having covens, right? Yeah. Well, or, we, or is that more That's that's in the, the, the last episode we kinda of learned more about that, right? Yeah. Um the a non traditional pew 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 was when death cuts through reality as a practical mm. effect of just cutting a big sort of tarp in the back yeah the background oh i love that part yeah that was great do you know what that reminded me of was uh do you remember the movie dogma tim where the the demons use the hockey sticks and they slash through and sort of jump from place to place by doing that mm. 
the, right. the, the, the roller hockey playing demons, they use their hockey sticks to like basically slash a hole in reality and then jump through and then the portals close back up again. That yeah, was, I, was, I, I yeah. was a little disappointed with the special effects that they didn't close up the, the, the rip after she steps through, right? Yeah. Although, again, knowing what you find out in the final episode about just, or you know, how, like what this really was, what the, what the road really was, the fact that she could easily go from place to place makes perfect sense because death is everywhere. Yeah. Well, this is this is the episode where they had the the big metal room, right? Too. I thought that was a really cool, interesting on the last trial, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. With the with the time time counting down. Mm-hmm. 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 Very sort of futuristic. Yeah, and again, like, how do you make something grow in a space like that? And then her finding that one little little dandelion seed in with the locket of of Nikki's hair, and using using the tear that she has to to plant it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then good. Jen, Jen climbing out of the ground, right? Well, she does that at the beginning of episode nine, right? Because here we just see her; she just vanishes, and so does Billy. And then Agatha finally sort of finds her way out, and then that turns into the big fight scene. The 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 quote that I like the best was, I mean, Catherine Hahn is just a treasure, but when she's talking to Jen and she says, "Your name is a vegetable, the worst kind. It's like swallowing a doily." Uh, I mean, who among us, who who among us has not thought that about Kale? Um, and then, yeah, that sort of scene where we go back to, to Billy's room and, and then he's looking around and looking at the posters and looking at the toys and looking at all the stuff and sort of realizing like, Hey, wait a minute. Was, did like, did this really happen? Yeah. How, like how coincidental is all this? And, you know, again, I think we all had that sort of. It's kind of like these... Kevin's room in time bandits, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Like, did I do this? Is this real? Did I dream this? Like, how did this happen? Yeah. And it's all, um, I mean, that, that's an Easter egg, egg, Easter egg hunt itself, his room, right? Yep. And then, you know, the episode ends with Boo and a very startled Billy, which jumps us straight over. Did you have uh, any good questions for uh, knowing that we were sort of jumping from one right into the next episode? Well, my first question was where where are we going to go from here? Like, you mm. know, even mm. even past episode nine, right? Well, although it's kind of revealed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, the couple of things that I, that I had. Oh, I, I should remember my quote. So in Westview, the people have gone through Wanda's thing, yeah. and they're like, "Oh, is it happening again?" <laughs> like it's just like a normal weekday thing for witches stuff to occur. I thought they were a little blasé about it. You'd think these people would have like severe PTSD. The fact that they still live in this community is one thing, but I thought they would be like outside. You just want to see one of them like throw up or crap themselves or something like, you know, yeah. wouldn't you be traumatized after all that you went through before? And wouldn't somebody be like, hey, where's Mrs. Davis? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I did have one big question about like through all this, you know, were Billy and Tommy real were they brought to reality uh by wanda herself manifested uh there's kind of weirdness around it i think this points towards they are in some way shape or form given well, that they they have ability to to move elsewhere yeah i mean they established essentially that they through the magic that wanda created that they have a soul but then at the end of one division they don't have a body anymore they just have they're basically rogue souls they just they exist and that's why they can sort of jump into other people's empty bodies because mm-hmm. they're essentially mm-hmm. just souls. There is a long and oh my lord convoluted explanation from the comic books that if you uh, if we want to talk about it here we can or we can talk about it another time. But uh, there is there is a long and convoluted explanation as to exactly what Billy and Tommy uh, were slash are slash will be, and it does that's... involve the word Mephisto. <laughs> okay, um, I, I did have my. Uh it's kind of cheating from an Easter egg hunt, but I felt like it was worth mentioning comic book wise that although the movie version, uh, the MCU version of Thanos is very different in this respect. The comic book version was obsessed with the embodiment of yep. death. Yep. And, and that's why he does this whole infinity gauntlet thing in the comics version of Thanos. Yep. And death is a, like a long recurring character, like the embodiment, the physical embodiment of death has been a comic book character for 50 plus years, uh, popping up in different circumstances. But you're right, Jaime, like the number one thing when you think of the character of death in the MCU is Thanos' obsession with her, trying to prove to her that he's worthy of her love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, last one. Last one. Episode 9, Maiden Mother Crone. 
which we get to meet Agatha as all of those things. Um, yeah, so I, I had Jaime's, uh, it was Billy all along, because that's kind of what we get out of this episode. I went with, it was Agatha all along uh, on this one. They, they, they kind of both make this happen, and this mm. shows mm-hmm. how. And so that's why I paired up the previous one was, as of the eighth episode, it's like, oh, it was Billy all along. There was no Witch's Road. And this one is kind of like, the Witch's Road was a scam that became real this one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the one time it worked. Mine was, uh, I'm going to go 1970s TV show, The Ghost and Mr. Mr. Mar- How do you say his name again? Muir? No, Maximov. Oh, Maximov, yes. Mm-hmm. The Ghost mm-hmm. and Mrs. Maximov. Or Ghost and Mr. Maximov. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, this, um, it's funny because we had already had the sort of flashback episode in uh, episode, I guess it was five or six that told Billy's backstory and we really hadn't gotten the, you know, that, the what happened with Nikki, you know, all these sort of rumors about what had, what Agatha had done throughout the years and everything else. So it was kind of an interesting way to sort of jump from that moment uh, where we see Agatha actually die in the previous episode to have her suddenly get her backstory posthumously. And we get her basically, her uh, pregnant, her delivering the baby, and then her making the deal with death, where she basically says, like, no, I want more time. And death saying, or Rio saying, all I can give you is a bit more time. And knowing that, you know, Nikki's not for long. Um, and But just seeing that relationship and seeing, you know, what Agatha's principles are, and then seeing what Nikki's principles are, and then, you know, obviously the tragedy of his death and what that sort of drives her to the origin of the of the the song and how she actually used it um i thought that was a really kind of poetic way to sort of tie it all together at the end yeah i had the same quote of i can only offer time the i thought the pew 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 for this one like again it wasn't a pew 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 heavy episode but i thought the her that montage of her singing the song with different covens over time to steal their power and using that same line of basically an- antagonizing them after singing the song, saying, oh, you're, you're useless and having them attack her and then steal the powers, which is what she mm-hmm. she yells at them in, in the second episode, right? She's like, you know, oh, just blast me, you, you know, whatevers. Um, knowing that that's, that was really what she was trying to do all along when the, it, was a, it was a scam. She was essentially trying to get these witches together so she could steal their powers. But she wasn't anticipating that that Billy was so powerful that he could actually create a road. Yeah, yeah. I had the same uh, montage of the purple drain across different uh, eras. Yeah. Um, And it sort of ties back into that quote that where, you know, you're so much like your mother and, you know, she's not my mother. I have a mother. The quote from Agatha in this one where she says, unlike your mother, sorry, Wanda you actually did something interesting with your powers where she, you know, she sort of acknowledges that he's not just the Scarlet Witch's son, that he is something else. Yeah. I thought, um, I wasn't sure how how they were going to land this, but I was pretty good. It was like, I, I, as you guys know, I, I, I'm pretty good at sort of finding loopholes and plots and stuff like that. But this was, this was really well done. I didn't see every single twist. I, I thought they did a, a really good job of of those last two episodes of Who winding those two pieces together mm-hmm. hmm. yeah. and then and then ending up with ghost agatha who uh is a comic book character also agatha is a is a ghost in the comics as well um at times she was she was first a living person then she was a ghost don't ask me how but eventually she was a living person again um but yeah the fact that they kind of have this open door to Hey, let's go find Tommy. This adventure is going to continue. Is is really interesting. Um, which I guess is my big question: is this is obviously a to be continued? We know that this is sort of the the middle of a three part trilogy with Wandavision, Agatha all along, leading to Vision Quest, which is supposed to be coming in the next couple of years, probably twenty twenty six. Focusing on the Paul Bettany white vision character trying to figure out who he is. I wonder if that's where we see the continuation of this story in that one as well. But um, what did you yeah, guys... Well, like you said, the people don't die in comic books. They can almost come back, right? So, Well, that's... Right. I mean, what would be the fun in killing off a comic book character? I mean, obviously there's drama in it, but 
like you you want to be able to use great characters, right? Well, I mean, the whole her whole trick of creating covens so she can steal power kind of reveals her whole, you know, modus operandi, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, I, I wouldn't call this uh, Easter egg. It was more thinking about this episode's title in particular and looking at the the sort of meta analysis of this is a very uh, feminine positive series mm-hmm. um it, it, and there's a lot of talk of reclaiming uh or being ashamed of things that are viewed as witches things to do like the writing their brooms because it's like domesticity and and mm-hmm. other things so i viewed the maiden mother crone as a potential way to reclaim the sort of patriarchy's shallow view of femininity mm. of, mm. of of being you know highly desirable uh, at, at most you know potentially valuable as maiden right it assumed in a patriarchal society to be pure and virginal uh, and then of course reaping some of that benefit as as mother losing themselves as uh, value as an individual and being bored as a a supporter of some other entity a child or children and then the real sad tossing aside of like crone is is like ugly old woman is the little definition i had to look it up to make sure i had it right and it's like that's really sad way to think about it of like they have lost their value of like they're no longer you know young virginal they're no longer raising children because the children are adults like you have no value that's not true but it is one of those things that i think can can happen uh to downplay the role of of femininity and etc so i i felt like there was a reason they chose this particular title it felt like a pretty fitting end to the series. Yeah, very well said, Jaime. So my question to the two of you, we've now finished this one. Where does this rank as far as the Marvel Disney Plus shows in your mind? And I can I have a list here in case you need a little little jogging. So we're talking about Agatha, Secret Invasion, Loki Season 1 and 2, Ms. Marvel, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Echo, Moon Knight, WandaVision. And I suppose you could add what if in there. Oh, and Hawkeye, sorry. And Hawkeye. Oh, and She-Hulk. Jeez, I'm forgetting more. Of all the mm-hmm. of all those yeah, series like, there. Yeah, what, yeah. You know, I mean, there are some shows that are better than others in there. I, you know, I really like WandaVision. I thought that was just such a really visually interesting show and like kind of went somewhere that was a little different. Same with Loki. I really enjoyed the first season of Loki for that same reason. I thought Ms. Marvel was a little bit of a straight play as was hawkeye but i actually enjoyed them because i enjoyed the characters but this is very high for me i i really thought that they did a good job of making you care about the characters giving them real depth and emotion giving them giving them stakes and you know agatha as sort of the hero anti-hero was a really interesting protagonist alongside um billy i thought this this was pretty strong this is, you know, I, I really enjoyed this series. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I like this one a lot. It uh, definitely benefited from really solid performances mm-hmm. uh, all around. The The practical effects, I think, really helped it make it feel different uh, than like a CGI fest. Mm-hmm. And the, the kind of interesting balance I see here is that it does lean a lot on you understanding what happened in WandaVision at the very least. Yes, it's really hard for it to stand alone. Um, but I also appreciated how they say a lot, but not too much about Agatha's relationship with death. Mm. Right. The death, the the Aubrey Plaza character is like, look, man, like I, I gave you a benefit that nobody else is supposed to get. Like when I come for you, I come for you no matter what. And I, I, I gave your son more time. And Agatha doesn't view that as like sufficient. And he, you can sort of understand it like, well, why would death even be so enamored? It's like, well, because Agatha like racks up the bodies pretty <laughs> these is, yeah. this is easy pickings, right? It's like, hey, uh, just shout out to you for the loyalty card. We didn't have that before. <laughs> you found a way through your innovation. Um, and I don't think that they really had to like come straight out and say what happens there. It feels like they sort of trust people to fill in more of the why do they have this uh, longstanding relationship. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. No. Oh, great stuff. All right. Watch list it up. Let's watch list it up. 
You guys go ahead. I had uh, posted in our Slack channel today, and I've got it in our show notes here. Uh, one of my favorite sketch comedy groups is uh, these three fellows from Ireland called Foil Arms and Hog, um, who I've been lucky enough to see when they first came to Canada a couple of years back with my daughter. Uh, they they do this running bit where they do uh, sort of you know. Uh, questions that you'd get asked at uh to you know cross the border from one country to the other uh, or to pass through uh, customs things you know about these different countries and they they do it as a satire they've done it for a lot of different countries i think i posted the one previously about getting into canada there are ones for a lot of different places but today they decided to have some fun and did the uh you know how to get into the empire and uh, it's a very funny, it's only about three minutes long of, you know, these two guys basically being interviewed at the border by Darth Vader. Uh, you know, what do you know about the Empire? Like, you know, who is the evil empire? Oh, uh, Disney. You know, like it's, uh, it's, it's a very funny little, little take on the Star Wars stuff. So if you get a chance, I recommend that. Um, the other thing that I flagged was uh, we found out uh, as part of this last two episodes of Agatha, they showed us a little trailer that talked about, you know, hey, here's what's coming, you know, in the short term and long term for Disney+. Plus. One of the things that jumped out quickly was that uh, Deadpool and Wolverine, the big blockbuster uh, from this summer, is coming to Disney+, Plus on November 12th. So we really are very uh, less than a couple of weeks away from being able to rewatch that one. I think that's a movie that's going to really benefit from some rewatches because it is, as we talk about Easter eggs, that thing is just absurdly packed with Easter eggs. So uh, I'm looking forward to giving that one another watch. Uh, Obviously it's been on, um, on demand for a little while now, but uh, being able to watch it at your leisure, should you be a Disney plus subscriber? It's pretty darn convenient. So yeah. What do you got, Jaime? I finally got around to watching Devs on Hulu. This is oh, circa no. 2020. All the cool kids have watched it, so I'm definitely <laughs> last. <laughs> um, Not last but, time, I. Eh? Yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was a, it was a good, solid one. Yeah. And really appreciated the fact that it does, without spoilers, it does wrap up uh, in a concrete way. My significant another, when we started watching, he's like, are you sure it's good? Because how come there hasn't been a second season in this era of there always has to be a second season if it, mm. if it doesn't have a second season it must suck it got canceled right and i was, I was like no no, no I'm, I, hear me out i bet you I, I heard it's good i got i have people with street cred who tell me it's good so <laughs> let, let's watch and and we enjoyed it yeah i watched that when it was first came out and it took me a while to figure out that the actress who plays the main character she's um the other robot from um ex machina AI. huh from Ex Machina with Alicia Vikander. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess uh, if you wanted, you could also know that she's uh, from House of the Dragon as well. Oh, yes. Which, which yeah, I didn't yeah, recognize. She's the, the lady uh, of, of whispers, I guess. Um, yeah, the warm lady, yeah. And uh, warm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Although it's not quite a pick, um, Civil War is by the same... Uh, creator, director, or showrunner kind of guy. And you look back and you're like, wait a minute, this dude uses the same actors all the time. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of devs actors in that, um, in that movie as well. Interesting. I didn't, I didn't realize that. That's interesting. Yeah. What kind of Americans are you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of Americans? Yeah. So that's it, the, it's, this is Alex Garland you're talking about, right? The, uh, so he, um, is probably best known for like 28 days later. That was his oh, sort of yeah. big break. He also did the dread movie that, that great, um, the more modern one, uh, where it's like dread. What's it uh, called? Dread. Like judge dread. Oh, judge dread. Yeah. The one with, with, um, Carl Urban. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm, he did that mm-hmm. one as well. Um, yeah, he's, he's a, a really interesting filmmaker. I have not watched all of his stuff, but I've enjoyed everything I've watched. And yeah, ex machina is like, that's a really interesting and trippy movie. Including Poe Dameron and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, was it Admiral Hux, Hux Vice Admiral yeah. Hux or whatever? Yeah. Admiral Hux, yeah. General Hux, I think. Is he General? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that's, I forgot about of... the joke from the second movie. Hello, is General Hux there? <laughs> <laughs> did you guys watch Annihilation? Yeah. He did that movie too, and I never watched that one. Yeah, uh, the one with yeah, uh, yeah that's with um, yeah, Natalie Portman, Natalie Portman and... I think, and also yeah, uh, Oscar Isaac as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Hmm. There's a thread we have to go back and unravel. There you go. Time to dive down the uh, Alex Garland rabbit hole. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have anything today except that I've been watching, um, catching up on the um, 
dark material stuff mm. when I can. Between between watching all the other stuff, I'm, there's a couple of shows have come out on kind of Apple TV that I watch. Mm-hmm. Shrinking is one of them, uh, which has a Star Wars connection. Um, <laughs> Pretty good one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, who's the little furry character who runs around with Han Solo? The little furry George Lucas. The little? So, the, so not George Chewbacca because he'd be very large? Oh, George Lucas. George that's Lucas. right. That's George right. Lucas. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, with that, uh, that's it for another week. So, Jonathan, people in touch with you, where would they find you? Uh, well, uh, I would suggest you could look for me on Instagram. It's at JPK News. Or you can look for me on uh, YouTube at YouTube.com slash at JPK. All right. And then, uh, Jaime, where can people get a hold of you? I'm on Twitter as at Dev of the Hair. All right. My name is Timitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A. On the social thingies, uh, Mastodon, Blue Sky. Um, What's that one called? Threads. Yeah. <laughs> so those those are the only three. No, no, I'm on, I'm on the fourth one too, but I'm not going to mention them. Yeah, I, I, I'm disassociating. Yep. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens in a few days. Mm-hmm. So until next time. By the way, we're recording on Halloween, so happy Halloween, everybody. Um, yeah. Until next time, we'll see you in the future. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Spotcast podcast. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at patreon.com slash spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. thing oh my god <laughs> like those are expensive seats i you know people brought up the um Bartman. holders too those guys apparently yeah they were banned from game five i feel like this needs permaban and and here's why right like there's interference like i think it was like steve bartman from the chicago cubs and yep. uh, accidentally caused his own cubs. Had to change his name and move out of town yeah yeah, I mean, really? that was like... Because he pulled the, he was listening to the radio and he pulled the ball away from one of his own players that cost them an out that ended up losing them the game. Yeah, oh, right. but this was like, you know, a, a bang-bang play kind of thing of like, what would you do? This thing is flying towards you mm-hmm. at the time. I'm like, I blame the people who make the stands able to do this versus having the, uh, you know, the, the, the lion pit or the gorilla pit that separates you at the zoo from, yeah. the, from the beast, right? Um, yeah. However, in this case, with the we're talking about the Dodgers Yankees uh, game uh, in the World Series. I'm like, not only did was it not a bang bang play, you were hanging on to the guy's glove trying to rip the ball out, and your buddy who is not involved in the bang bang play is grabbing his other wrist. I'm like, you've you've presumably committed some sort of assault and battery here. Uh, well, not, I was going to say, a lawyer. Like, what about the guy's wrist? Like, was he able to continue the game and? It was like they were pulling, they were pulling it like he was stretched out to his, his full length. Right. And they were like mm-hmm. yanking on his arm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a, it's an area where, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a strong believer of like, look, you can't accommodate people like this. Like, for example, uh, it might be controversial to say, but I'm like, every time you have some idiot that runs onto the field, I'm like, they should be tased. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, mandatory right. tasing until yep. this stops. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, nothing would set set them straight like a good clubbing. Exactly. <laughs> True. Oh, next thing, they'll be, they'll be driving around in garbage trucks with orange vests on. <laughs> so, uh, Jaime, how are you feeling about uh, what's what's coming up next week? I'm... The season, oh, the yes, season sorry, finale I had, of America? Of, I had to think about it. I've got, like, a, a bazillion Tim, Tim, things Tim, going on. Tim, didn't you call it the season finale of America? The season yeah, finale, yeah. It gets, it gets real interesting. Um, 
we'll see we'll see what happens here uh I mean, I mean the, the the big the big climactic thing is is the event on Tuesday, but it's what happens after Tuesday is going to be the the really interesting thing. I don't think even John could figure out this plot plot point. Oh no! And I'm I mean I've been obsessed with obsessed with this reality TV show for a while now, and I still am like I I don't know how to I don't I don't think there's any way to know what's going to happen until it happens. No, it's got it's got to be a le- well. I don't know if you heard so. We are talking about the American election, which we normally don't do. But have you guys heard about the Red Mirage? No. So the Red Mirage is that um, a lot of Republican, um, like, locales or whatever, right? Their votes are counted early because they're smaller. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and of course, they don't count mail-in ballots until the very end. And that's just something that's done. So when the... When the broadcasts start, the Republicans naturally lead because of the fact that their votes are like the writings that they're counting in are smaller, like less people. Yep. So the, the, the counting is faster. Yep. So at the beginning of the evening, it looks like the Republicans are winning seats left, right and center. And that's not until a little bit later, they, they called it the blue mist or something like that or whatever, but uh, that the Democrat votes start to come in and then things change. And that's why Trump in 2016, again, sorry, apologize, we're talking about politics, but which we swore we would never do or use the T word on this show. <laughs> but um, and I've just broken it twice. I guess I've like this episode is explicit now. Um, the that person uh, starts claiming that miraculously, yeah, they're all finding votes. Vote. Yeah, 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 they're finding votes, and and he, that's what he that's the, how he played it last last time to rile people up, and he'll do it again next Tuesday. The reason why I'm talking about the the Red Mirage is there's a campaign to let people know that this is the the reality of how the the original part of the evening starts mm-hmm. when they start recording. Reporting on the results from the writings, right? They call them writings in the states. I don't know. What they call them that in Canada. I'm not familiar with that term. So no, it's like districts, uh, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah districts, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah the, and, it, and it's it's funny because you know the the it doesn't matter what the popular vote does apparently because you know the the Democrats won the last two elections in terms of popular vote, right? Yes, we do have a very strange structure around that that has really bizarre uh, modern takes on that, but it does have a historical uh, need, um, or at least perceived need. Whether it was actually a correct need at the time is definitely a thing for the historians. Uh, but it is a it is a fact that you know you end up with a. It, here, here's the best way of putting it, right? I, I constantly remind folks of like, your country is like a singular country. My country is 50 countries in a trench coat mm-hmm. pretending to be one country. Yeah. Right. Uh, when, when you <laughs> refer to us as America, I'm like, mm, that's very inaccurate. It is United States of America. Uh, and so you you end up with, with some differences there that um, – that manifests themselves weirdly. So like my state, Washington state is, uh, it's not that you can only just be really clear. It's not only mail-in ballot, but everybody has access to mail-in ballots. So I, I voted, uh, when did I vote three or four days ago? And I had the ballot in my hand since two or three days before that. Right. And we still have, you know, about a week to go or a little less than a week to go. And that, uh, and it can vary from state to state. Some states are like, we'll start tallying them up. We won't tell anybody, but we'll start tallying them up now. And some are like, nope, not going to break the seal on this until actual election day itself. And it's very, uh, very weird there as opposed to, and we don't have mandatory voting and our voting like in a very good year is like 30% turnout of potential people who could have voted. This is quite different than uh, I think Australia has something like 98% because it's mandatory, but they've also made like uh, sausage day or something. Like, there's like free food and they've turned it into kind of like a festival almost. So I would love to see <laughs> uh, here mandatory voting, mandatory day off. Everybody gets freedom mandatory barbecue. Uh, voting privilege. Yeah. <laughs> freedom barbecue. <laughs> you know. Since that's how we, we, we like to measure things in freedom and barbecue. Uh, <laughs> Should there be fireworks too, Jaime? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you can pass out 
you know, little bald eagle uh, beanie babies to, to everyone, you know, whatever. <laughs> just, just it, every it should just be like NASCAR or something, you know. Everybody got all of their just have the politicians with their their, their logos of the sponsors just right on there. Well, well, <laughs> it'd be fun time next week. We yeah, talk about the best mm-hmm. pew pew and uh, yeah, really. Should we do what our they said? Yeah, and, best quote. Any Easter eggs? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the big question: Who won? Yeah, who really won? Yeah. Yep. So we're next week is just Penguin and Lord X. Mm-hmm. Is it? Yep. Because we finished up Agatha, and then mm. we, we have to decide um, in the week after if we want to start doing things. Because I think Silo comes the week after that. If we want to talk about that, mm. okay. And um, yeah, as we head towards the end of November, we're gonna get um, oh Star Wars. Go, uh, what's it called? Uh, Skeleton Crew. Skeleton Crew is coming beginning of December. Mm-hmm. The shows never stop. They never stop. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. I think it's Skeleton Crew. I saw a release schedule for it, and one of the episodes comes on like Christmas Eve. I was like, well, that's all right. Not that I mind now that my kids are, are grown, but it's definitely, uh, I don't know if you get your maximum audience there or people just are going to watch it sometime over the holidays. I don't know. What's that? Uh, yeah. Skeleton Crew. Yeah, it's not the Chinese food. Um... Oh, well, yeah, all my Jewish friends are like, that's the best day of the year. The movie theaters are, are showing yeah. new movies. There's Chinese food. It's excellent. Yeah. yeah. Show enough. Yep. All right. We can say goodbye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.